I don't tick. I am not a machine. If I did tick, I should have no views on it, and you had better ask the winder. My work did not evolve into a serious work. It started like that. The so-called children's story was a fragment torn out of an already existing mythology. In so far as it was dressed up for children, in style or manner, regret it. So do the children. I am a philologist, and all my work is philological. I avoid hobbies because I am a very serious person and cannot distinguish between private amusement and duty. I am affable, but unsociable. I only work for private amusement, since I find my duties privately amusing. For many years I wrote without publishing a word. Now that I've finally begun publishing, it brings me nothing but inconvenience. There are so many letters, whole bundles of letters from people believing themselves to know better than I how my story should be interpreted, people who want to find proof in it for their belief in reincarnation, and I don't know what else. Some try to read my books as allegory. They believe them to be about the conflict between East and West, and some send me their own illustrations and suggestions for improvements. It's as if they all want to be part of it. Yes, it is strange for an old philologist to step into the literary world. It's all about power, of course, and about virtue struggling against power. The story is about an insignificant creature put to a test transcending his abilities, and about how that changes him, how it draws out the strength within him. Of course, it is a pessimistic story. I have tried to make it timeless, to show that evil is timeless, that it prevails as often as good. It started with languages. I was hospitalized during the First World War, and spent my time reading the Kalevala. And then I got the idea to try to do it all over, you see, to write my own fairy tale. But it would have a different atmosphere a completely other feeling that provided by the Finnish names. With the help of a language I made up myself, I invented new individual names. Writing fairy tales and inventing languages were two favorite pastimes of my childhood. The names gave me ideas and visions. And I have continued ever since. The tale isn't finished, and it is longer than you believe, much longer. You must remember that I've kept at it since 1917. What I have published, you see, is just a part of a much larger tale. It is very long, spanning about a thousand years. And there are so many stories. My idea is to publish most of it before I die, if anyone is interested in it. As a whole, it makes up a kind of history. I also tried to carry the story on forward in time, but I couldn't. It became so dark that it frightened me. Well, there are so many stories. Of course, some have said that I am some sort of escapist, that I've remained in some sort of prolonged boyhood stage. But to write that, isn't that just an instance of plain, simple lovelessness? It is pronounced Tolkien as if it was spelled with two E's. I am retired. The retiring age in Oxford now is 66. That's right, so I am retired for a great many years. No, I remain here a fellow of my college as a kind of honor. I am entitled Emeritus Professor. Oh yes, I live here. I do, but they are now all grown up. I have four children. The eldest is 48, and youngest 36. Well, I think it's been building up, you know. I think it's an error to say that it was really related to the Ace Books edition. I think that simply the Ace Books were very wisely advised to bring it out at the right time, whereas the other people did not. It's Horton Mifflin of Boston, really, but I think it was building up steadily, you know, and the book was really making its own way. There was a very large fan mail long before this so called explosion. Yes. It has gone on for years. Yes, I do. I shouldn't call it a fad. I wouldn't call it underground. I'd call it a game. Yes, because there is a whole lot of stuff that emisses people. Alphabets, 
history, etc. I don't mind it, as long as it doesn't become obsessive. It doesn't obsess me. No, I don't think things catch on like that here quite so much. Why? I've even had letters from children who have saved up, you know, who have gone to some work to get the hardback edition. I think it is, if you really want to know my opinion, a partly reactionary influence. I think it's part of the fun after so much rather more dreary stuff, isn't it? I should say the Lord of the Flies, wouldn't you? It's meant to please, it doesn't horrify. That's gone on for some time. I have had endless requests for help over there for some years. I do not, while I am alive anyhow. I do not know why they should research without any reference to me. After all, I hold the key. Yes, and they are very bad, most of them. They are nearly all either psychological analyses, or they try to go into sources, and I think most of them rather vain efforts. No, I am rather against that. I think that a lot of damage is really done to literature, in making it a method of education, but I'm not sure about that. Yes, I know, I think very often in the letters I get the influence of teachers who test me for sources, allegory, and all that kind of thing. Well, it wasn't, of course, so before. I suppose that was a matter of expense. In England, my fan mail is very largely adult, even without professorial letters. Yes, well, I don't know about that. Every day, yes, I think we have three. Why? No, I'm not one of those chaps. No, neither am I obsessed by my own work. I read newspapers, they're there, and I read them when I'm interested. I take a strong interest in what's going on, both in the university and in the country and in the world. I am still a professor and expert in my subject, and I'm still producing articles on it, and so on. When the ace book swept me away, I was just about to produce one, but it has been delayed. Two translations of medieval works, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and the other poem called The Pearl. In going to the press, I don't know. I suppose that now it's so delayed that I doubt it might come out this year. I doubt it. Well, I don't know because I take a very external view of it now. I don't remember writing a lot of it. One of the things I remember moving me most in quite different ways was the sound of the horns in the morning when the Nazgul sat in the gate of Rowan, of Minas Tirith. Another one, which I think is the most moving point in the story for me is when Gollum repents and tries to caress Frodo, and he is interfered with by Sam. The tragedy is that the good people so often upset the not-so-good people when they try to repent, and it's a tragic moment. No, I don't. I thought I made a steady driving climax, that things mount in excitement. And one of the problems in writing the book was to go one better. Well, I did name one. I said that one of my chief feelings was that it was too short. I think some of the appendices might well be cut down however. No, I don't think so. I think I was born with what you might call an inventive mind, and the books that have remained as those things which I acquired and don't really seem much like the book itself. For instance, I now find that I can't stand George MacDonald's books at any price at all. I find that now I can't take him. The same with most books that I've read. I suppose as a boy, she interested me as much as anything like the Greek shard of Amanatas, which was the kind of machine by which everything got moving. No, I've read a good many, but I don't like them. Well, that's quite wrong. Williams had no influence on me at all. I didn't even know him very well. I'll tell you one thing on that point. One of the things I remember Lewis is saying to me, of course, Lewis was very influenced as you may know, was, confound you, nobody can influence you anyhow. I have tried but it's no good. After someone had criticized me, I just went on my own sweet way and took no notice of it. No, I've been isolated, not a rebel. Williams had no conceivable influence on me. I disliked his whole Arthurian business with great intensity and considered it rather nonsense. 
it's only an old-fashioned word for world. That's all. Look in the dictionary. It isn't another planet. It takes a long time. It began a long way back, and it slowly boiled up. Of course, you go on producing and adding to it, but it never gets quite finished, but you see an imaginary country. No, I don't know. It was during the war, during the first war, when I was just growing up. You asked me what books move me. Mostly mythology moves me and also upsets me because most mythology is distasteful to people. But it seems to me that we miss something by not having a mythology which we can bring up to our own grade of assessment. That's what I always wanted to do, mythological things like Greek or Norse myths. I tried to improve on them and modernize them. To modernize them is to make them credible. The seed is linguistic, of course. I'm a linguist and everything is linguistic. That's why I take such pains with names. The real seed was starting when I was quite a child by inventing languages, largely to try to capture the aesthetic mode of the languages I was learning, and I eventually made the discovery that language can't exist in a void and if you invent a language yourself you can't cut it in half. It has to come alive. So really the languages came first and the country after. Reen is the elvish word for East. Asia, China, Japan, and all the things which people in the West regard as far away. And south of Harad is Africa, the hot countries. Yes, of course, northwestern Europe where I was born. Well, I wasn't there actually. But where my imagination comes from. I was actually born in Bloemfontein, South Africa. Oh, well, my parents both came from Birmingham in England. I happened to be born there by accident. But it had this effect. My earliest memories are of Africa, but it was alien to me, and when I came home, therefore, I had for the countryside of England both the native feeling and the personal wonder of somebody who comes to it. I came to the English countryside when I was about three or four. It seemed to me wonderful. If you really want to know what Middle Earth is based on, it's my wonder and delight in the Earth as it is, particularly the natural Earth and I also was born with the great love of trees. Yes, it has. Well, no, it is the real world. While you're inside the book it does exist. That's the whole point of literature, isn't it? As a matter of fact, insofar as, without harping or preaching on the side of various rather old-fashioned things like humility, valor, and so on, and courage, you can carry those over and I think it has rather an effect on people. Young folks are ready in their attitudes to rather be changed. But I didn't intend these things, because I didn't write it for children. That's why I don't like George MacDonald very much. He's a horrible old grandmother. That's a very fine woman figure, of course, really. The Queen is rather a mother. All this kind of stuff, ace books, correspondence, fan mail, all this interferes, you know. That's why I answer some of them very briefly or not at all. I'm an old man now, and I've got a short working day. I cannot go on working until two, as I used to. Not at all. Most of it is written, of course, but when I offered it to the publishers first and they turned it down, they were too high and might. But now the Lord of the Rings has been a success they want it and, of course, now it has to be made to fit the Lord of the Rings. I am hoping to get it out in the course of the next year. Because of the market and the interest I shall probably try to publish it bit by bit. Yes, my publishers have always been Allen and Unwin and Horton Mifflin in Boston. Mifflin will take the things right away. They're only too much desirous to get on with it. It isn't necessarily quite that. It's the beginning of what you might call history. What you have is an imaginary period in which mythology was still actually existing in the real world. Let's say you would have myths incarnate, but once that's gone, scattered, dispersed, all you get is the history of human beings, the play of good and evil in history. That's later on. That can apply to many ages. This is the beginning of history, when there are no more devils or angels to be seen walking about. Oh, but he wouldn't. I did write a continuation story. 
taking place about 100 years after the end of The Lord of the Rings. Of course, he'll go bad because he's sick of peace. Well, I haven't finished writing it because I didn't want to go on with it. It's called, The New Shadow. The people cannot bear for 100 years. After a hundred years of peace and prosperity, people would all be going into every kind of madness. Not necessarily war, but there are other evils just as bad. War is only outbreak of these. My view of current affairs is not as depressed as some people's. I should say that I'm a bit frightened that the Greeks hadn't got something in the saying that those whom the gods wish to destroy they first drive mad. It's like the Tower of Babel, isn't it? All noise and confusion. Yes, but I think that a little history cures you. The only thing is that the press of numbers makes everything bigger. I should have thought that living at the end of the 16th century would have been just as bad, but there weren't as many people around. Well, you know, there have been saviors before. It is very common thing. There have been heroes and patriots who have given up for their countries. You don't have to be a Christian to believe that somebody has to die in order to save something. As a matter of fact, December 25th occurred strictly by accident, and I let it in to show that this was not a Christian myth anyhow. It was a purely unimportant date, and I thought, well, there it is, just an accident. Spiders are the particular terror of northern imaginations. The female monster is certainly no deadlier than the male, but she is different. She is a sucking, a strangling, trapping creature. I never expected a money success. In fact, I never even thought of commercial publication when I wrote The Hobbit back in the 30s. It all began when I was reading exam papers to earn a bit of extra money. That was agony. One of the tragedies of the underpaid professor is that he has to do menial jobs. He is expected to maintain a certain position and to send his children to good schools. Well, one day I came to a blank page in an exam book and I scribbled on it. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. I knew no more about the creatures than that, and it was years before his story grew. I don't know where the word came from. You can't catch your mind out. It might have been associated with Sinclair Lewis Babbitt. Certainly not a rabbit, as some people think. Babbitt has the same bourgeois smugness that hobbits do. His world is the same limited place. Anyone who invents a language finds that it requires a suitable habitation and a history in which it can develop. A real language is never invented, of course. It is a natural thing. It is wrong to call the language you grow up speaking your native language. It is not. It is your first learnt language. It is a byproduct of the total makeup of the animal. He, C.S. Lewis, used to insist on my reading passages aloud as I finished them, and then he made suggestions. He was furious when I didn't accept them. Once he said, It's no use trying to influence you, you're uninfluenceable. But that wasn't true. Whenever he said, you can do better than that. Better Tolkien, please. I used to try. I wanted the money very badly to buy this house. I was three when I was brought to England. After the dry, barren places I had known, I had in a way been trained to savour the delicate English flowers and the grass I had this strange sense of coming home when I arrived. The Hobbit business began partly as dot for that happy childhood which ended when I was orphaned, at twelve. As a child, I was always inventing languages. But that was naughty. Poor boys must concentrate on getting scholarships. When I was supposed to be studying Latin and Greek, I studied Welsh and English. When I was supposed to be concentrating on English, I took up Finnish. I have always been incapable of doing the job in hand. The age of childhood sentiment has produced a dreadful undergrowth of stories adapted to what is conceived to be the measure of children's minds and needs. The old stories are balderized. The imitations are often merely silly or patronizing or covertly sniggering with an eye on the other grown-ups present. Believable fairy stories must be intensely practical. You must have a map, 
no matter how rough. Otherwise, you wander all over the place. In the Lord of the Rings, I never made anyone go farther than he could on a given day. I have constructed them by scientific methods. They must be at least be complete and as organized as the history of the elves. A lot of it is just straight teenage stuff. I didn't mean it to be, but it's perfect for them. I think they're attracted by things that give verisimilitude. Like Gregorian chants, you can't cramp narrative into dramatic form. It would be easier to film the Odyssey. Much less happens in it. Only a few storms. I don't know Ariosto and I'd loathe him if I did. Cervantes? He was a weed killer to romance. He doesn't attract me. He's full of spite and malice. I don't care for his petty relations with petty people in petty cities. In any case, I don't read much now, not even fairy stories. And then I'm always looking for something I can't find. Something like what I wrote myself. Of course, God is in the Lord of the Rings. The period was pre-Christian, but it was a monotheistic world. The one, of course. The book is about the world that God created, the actual world of this planet. Would you like an inscription? What kind? It's the high elvish greeting. Every morning I wake up thinking, good, another 24 hours of smoking. But I'll make an exception for you, as you're an old student of mine. But, my dear girl, everybody fails that. Every sentence is important, lively, and striking, deeply buried, he says, in the lunatic beliefs of children, and, my heart is in my works, not on my sleeve. I love revision. I am a natural niggler, fascinated by detail. But it is becoming evident that I had better get on, and leave what is printed, with its inevitable defects. I'm a very busy man, I always have been, with a great deal of my own work to do, and they keep on expecting a great book of me. Great book, is what they say and expect, and it alarms me. It seems to me comparable to a man who having eaten anything, from a salad to a complete and well-planned dinner, uses an emetic, and sends the results for chemical analysis. That's absolutely absurd, absurd, these wretched people who must find an allegory in everything. For one thing, a good deal of it was written before the 1930s. Books of that kind, in fact, any fiction, are nowadays mishandled. So often it is thought and taught that enjoyment is an illiterate reaction, and that a serious reader must take the construction to pieces, analyze, dissect, and so on. The choice of the ring as a link with the older stuff was inevitable. Most of the allusions to older legends scattered about the tale, or summarized in Appendix A are to things which really have an existence of some kind in the history of which the Lord of the Rings is part. The relationship between science fiction and fantasy is difficult and topically important. At present, there's a good deal of serious dissension among SF writers, especially in the Science Fiction Writers Association of America. Obviously, many readers of SF are attracted to it because it performs the same operation as fantasy. It provides recovery and escape. I analyze these in my essay on fairy stories and wonder. But when they invoke the word science and use an element of scientific knowledge, very variable, sometimes, in scope and accuracy, Authors nowadays are more easily able to produce suspension of disbelief. The legendary laboratory, Professor, has replaced the wizard. It's a very good medium for the imagination to work with, of course. But it's been much misused by lesser writers, as if a lot of them will never come to terms with it. Just as, for instance, a composer will make special use of horns, if he is specially interested in them. Nothing has given me more pleasure than the praise of those who like my books for my names, whether of English form, or Elvish, or other tongues. I had to posit a basic and phonetic structure of primitive Elvish, and then to modify this by a series of changes, such as actually do occur in known languages, so that the two end results would each have a consistent structure and character, but be quite different. I have met very few, either in person or by letter, 
among the most intelligent who can distinguish between the two different elvish languages, or see or feel that, say, the hymn to Elbereth is in an entirely different mode and prosody from that of Galadriel's lament. But I think language, too, is often neglected by them, that is to say, language as an invention, and as the most important single ingredient in human culture in general, or in any particular culture. They treat it comparatively poorly in descriptions of strange cultures, and the problems of communications between alien beings in different worlds, with which they are often faced, are apt to be perfunctorily and unconvincingly treated. I think that some are interested in and know something about mechanical, computer, analyses of language, but few know anything about its phonetics, history, or process of change. Then there is language, three, word and name making as a minor art form, which hardly anyone thinks of, and fewer practice. Few people have by talent or education the experience for this. They have little feeling for the sound texture and structure of the native language, unless for any others they happen to be acquainted with. They know little or nothing of the history of them, or of their visible symbols. In consequence, even if they thought it important, they would have no notion how to set about making a group of names, or supposed alien words that belong to, and feel and look like belonging to, a real language with a definite character of its own. When they invent names and words, these are apt to take on a quite childish level. The names are absolutely appalling in many cases, they simply don't bother with them. They leave me totally unconvinced. But this is not peculiar to SF. It is quite as evident in fantasy. E. R. Edison is a notable example, all the more because he was a great writer. There's a time and a place for everything. Love is the background of history not least, when least attended to. In the time of a great war and high adventure, love and the carrying on with the race, and so on, are in the background. They're not referred to, the whole time, but they're there. There's surely enough given in flashes for an attentive reader to see, even without the appendix, of Aragorn and Arwen, the whole tale as one aspect of the love story of this pair, and the achievement of a high noble and romantic love. There's Eowyn's love for Aragorn, a sort of calf love, as well as the true romance. You get the scene in Rivendell, with Aragorn suddenly revealed in princely dignity to Frodo, standing by Arwen. There's Aragorn's vision, after he has plighted his troth to Arwen and left her, and what were his thoughts after receiving the furled standard, or when he unfurled it after achieving the paths of the dead. There is also Sam, who had other deep concerns, though he put his service first. It seems that Gollum is about to repent, and that Sam waking up suddenly like that, and naturally feeling full of righteous resentment, has spoiled the chance. But there wasn't the chance for Gollum. He'd been evil for too long. There's a point of no return in these things, and Gollum had passed it. What an impossible question. How can I possibly answer it? I simply don't know. I do not know. It was there. Why does anyone write anything? They liked it. Weren't absolutely wild about it. They quite liked it. I am a storyteller. If the disaster of 1939 had never occurred, and all subsequent history had been different, I don't think my take would have been much affected. The things that are actually supposed to have already happened in the book are all written down, you know. Except for one thing. If you remember the allusion to the cats of Queen Beruthiel that could find their way on a blind night, I don't know a thing about her really, not a thing. Odd, isn't it? She just popped up like that and obviously called for attention. I have a notion that she was the wife of one of the ship kings at Pelagir. She hated the life by the sea, the smells, the gulls, and so on, and went to live inland, and went to the bad. She hated cats, but liked her. You know how sometimes they do follow people who loathe them. She used to torture them, but she kept some. Trained them to go on evil missions, I'm afraid to spy on people and frighten them. She's the one exception that puzzles me. It's a very good medium for the imagination to work with, of course, 
though it's been much misused by lesser writers. There's a terrible undergrowth of rubbish, though probably not worse than that produced as fairy tales or fantasy. I think that good writers can write, and therefore write good dialogue, but I also think that many of them neglect languages as an invention and a communication, the most important ingredient in human culture, and that problems of communications between alien cultures are not always carefully enough treated. And the names are absolutely appalling. They just don't bother to give them verisimilitude or consistency. They leave me totally unconvinced. I run to the window every time I hear a whoosh. My stories seem to germinate like a snowflake around a piece of dust, exhausting. God help us, yes. Most of the time, I'm fighting against the natural inertia of the lazy human being. The same old university don who warned me about being useful around the house once said, it's not only interruptions, my boy. It's the fear of interruptions, oh that. It was given to me by my guardian, who was half Spaniard. It isn't there for anything at all except that inside it are all the things I've been going to answer for so many years, I've forgotten what they are. It was typical native psychology, but it upset everyone very much, of course. I know he called his son Isaac after himself, Mr. Tolkien after my father and Victor Haha after Queen Victoria. Hobbits have what you might call universal morals. I should say they are examples of natural philosophy and natural religion. People still love thatched houses. They pretend it's because they're cool in summer and warm in winter, and they'll even pay a bit of extra insurance. We found German trenches which were often very habitable indeed except that, when we reached them, they faced the wrong way about. And have you been to England's oldest pub, the trip to Jerusalem? It is carved out of the solid rock of Nottingham Castle. I went to Nottingham once for a conference. I fear we went to the trip to Jerusalem and let the conference get on with itself. I don't like small creatures. Hobbits are three to four feet in height. You can see people walking around like that. If there was anything I detested, it was all that Drayton stuff. Hideous. All that hiding in cowslips. Shakespeare took it up because it was fashionable, but it didn't invite his imagination at all. He produced some nice, funny names like Cobweb, Peas Blossom and so on. And some poetic stuff about Titania, but he never takes the slightest notice of her. She makes love to a donkey. The Hobbit, was written in what I should now regard as bad style, as if one were talking to children. There's nothing my children loathed more. They taught me a lesson. Anything that in any way marked out, The Hobbit, as for children instead of just for people, they disliked instinctively. I did too, now that I think about it. All this, I won't tell you any more, you think about it. Stuff. Oh no, they loathe it. It's awful. Children aren't a class. They are merely human beings at different stages of maturity. All of them have a human intelligence, which even at its lowest is a pretty wonderful thing, and the entire world in front of them. It remains to be seen if they rise above that. That's all spoof. You might scribble something on the back of an envelope and shove it in your back pocket, but that's all. You couldn't write. This would be an enormous dugout. You'd be crouching down among the flies and filth. But as I say somewhere, even the goblins weren't evil to begin with. They were corrupted. I've never had those sort of feelings about the Germans. I'm very anti that kind of thing. It is not about anything but itself. It provides a fairly goof living with moderately good husbandry and is tucked away from all the centers of disturbance. It comes to be regarded as divinely protected though people there didn't realize it at the time. That's rather how England used to be, isn't it? Working like hell. A pen is to me as a beak is to a hen. I have a very strong visual imagination, but it's not so strong in other points. I doubt if many authors visualize very closely faces and voices. If you write a long story like The Lord of the Rings, you've got to write it twice over, and you end up writing it backwards, of course. People will occur. One waits to see what's coming next. 
I knew there was going to be some trouble with tree-like creatures at one point or another. A lot of the criticism of the verses shows a complete failure to understand the fact that they are all dramatic verses. They were conceived as the kind of things people would say under the circumstances. The words are unworthy of the music. The invention of language is the foundation. The stories were made rather to provide a world for the language rather than the reverse. To me, a name comes first and the story follows. But, of course, such a work as The Lord of the Rings has been edited and only as much language has been left in as I thought would be stomached by the readers. I now find that many would have liked much more. I don't like anyone very much in that sense. I'm against generalizations. Art moves them. And they don't know what they've been moved by, and they get quite drunk on it. Many young Americans are involved in the stories in a way that I am not. But they do use this sometimes as a means against some abomination. There was one campus, I forget which, where the council of the university pulled down a very pleasant little grove of trees to make way for what they called a culture center, out of some sort of concrete blocks. The students were outraged. They wrote another bit of Mordor on it. I walked into the center of the city every day, from the age of eight. Children walked long distances in those days. There was a great mill pool, fed by leets from the river coal, and a small village community. A man called Forster owned a row of extremely nice-looking semi-detached cottages, in which he mostly seemed to have housed his gardeners. There was a miller and his son. I think their name was Andrews. There is always a miller in my tales, usually a surly one. It was a very treeish part, like open parkland. There was a willow hanging over the mill pool and I learned to climb it. It belonged to a butcher on the Stratford Road, I think. One day they cut it down. They didn't do anything with it. The log just lay there. I never forgot that. I strolled around the fields and rubbed up against the local lads. I was fascinated by their dialect and by their porky ways. The war made me poignantly aware of the beauty of the world. I remember miles and miles of seething, tortured earth, perhaps best described in the chapter about the approaches to Mordor. It was a searing experience. The Shire inspired by a few cherished square miles of actual countryside at Sarehole, near Birmingham. I loved it. There was an old mill that really did grind corn, with two millers that I used for Farmer Giles of Ham, a great big pond with swans on it, a sand pit, a wonderful dell with flowers, a few old-fashioned village houses and a stream with another mill. As for hobbits, they're just what I should like to have been but never was an entirely unmilitary people who always come up to scratch in an emergency. I always knew the book would go and it did. You start with P, T and K, then you introduce B, D and G followed by the nasals. I still remember seeing the name Ebu on a railway journey to Wales as a small child and never quite getting over the fascination of the name. I have to ration my time, I've another appointment this morning. Supposing you say some quite ordinary words to me, Celador, say from that, I might think of a name, Celador, and from that a character, a situation begins to grow. Later, I began inventing languages, but when I knew more about it, I realized they've got to exist in a culture, you've got to have people to speak them. I was distressed that almost all the myths were Welsh or Scots or Irish, French or German. All we English seemed to have were a few things like Jack the Giant Killer, so I thought I'd make one myself. I have an appointment with my dentist. My mouth has shrunk, you see, so my false teeth no longer fit and are inclined to drop down unexpectedly, with a portcullis-like effect. Not that there's any chance of a film being made. One didn't expect to survive, you know. Junior officers were being killed off, a dozen a minute. Parting from my wife then, we were only just married, it was like a death. That was the Lord's Prayer in Gothic. Do you realize that might have become the language of all Europe? 